<clears throat> What's happening, guys? Is the light bothering you? Is the light okay? I'm at Child of God's house again. I'll be here for a while as long as he lets me. Lord Jesus, bless him and his household. Fill him, his household, with the love of Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Wash them in the blood of Jesus. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Fill us with the love of Jesus Christ. Fill us with the Spirit and our loved ones. Cleanse us, purify us, wash us in the blood of the Lamb, Father. In your precious blood, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, sanctify us and purify us in the blood of Jesus. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. You guys can see I haven't shaved my head yet. Light not bothering you? My voice is still not 100%, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, filling my lungs, my chest, and throat with the breath of life to glorify Jesus Christ. Right? I'll be okay. All as well as with my soul. Right. All right. All is spirit. When I'm done with the session, I'll leave you a voice message. Or bless you, Pastor. Sorry, I just got text. Yeah, Niles guy, guys, guys, I want you to thank first and last and Protestant believer. I've given them the password to my YouTube channel. They are slowly, surely, methodically beatifying my YouTube channel. They're going to be putting content, thumbnails, and they're also going to help me put comments in the description box by the grace of Jesus Christ. And they're not getting paid for this. They're doing it out of love for Jesus Christ and his church to serve the church and help me to serve you, to make this as beautiful as possible, to draw people for the glory of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we do live in a time where things have to be sleek, polished, beautiful, right? Catchy. Unfortunately, that's the time we live in. Uh, some brother named Jonathan Sheffield. But anyway, I, you know what? I think I need to disappear for a couple more weeks because when I came back, we had about 170 people. Now that people got to see me again, they're used to me not showing up now. Man, I'm going to hate Heater Wood. How does he do it? How does he get 1,000? Because he's been doing it for years. Hold on. Let me. I don't want you to smell me because I smell bad. So here, let me freshen it up. <laughs> La, 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 la. All right. I want to wait a few more minutes. I'm drinking coffee, my friend. Andrew, the problem is until I get my own internet connection, I can't have a set schedule. It's hit or miss. But good news, guys. Here's good news. Good news. Lord Jesus willing, I move into my apartment this Monday. So I need you guys to keep praying for me and my daughters. Covenant with me by praying and fasting for miraculous protection, miraculous safety, so that in Jesus' name, they continue to show me favor here in this state. They work with me, and by the grace of Jesus Christ, I stay here. God save me from those evil, wicked agents of the devil in Illinois to keep them away from me so they don't hinder me. And by the grace of Jesus Christ, in due course, as I start getting furniture from my place, I'm going to get internet. Then I can have a set schedule. Because again, many of you already know this. I'm in full-time ministry since 1999. Since 1999, God put in my heart. Okay. I don't know why it's buffering here. This is child of God's. Hold on. Child of God's internet. Connection and it's quite strong. I don't know why it's buffering guys pray against it in Jesus name father Lord Jesus Holy Spirit bless this time bless the internet connection for your glory I don't even know why it's buffering here. It's not my brother's place. It's probably just the state. It's corrupt Their internet's corrupt. Anyway, so I've been doing full-time ministry since 1999. So all I do all I should be doing number one number one priority for everyone whether you're in full-time ministry or not number one priority Worship Jesus, love Jesus, <clears throat> glorify Jesus, and obey Jesus Christ. Okay. What's up, child? You handsome beast? How you doing, brother? Jildati, look at you. See, the man is gracious to let me in his house. Okay. Worship Jesus, love Jesus, glorify Jesus, obey Jesus, study his word to know him. Okay. All right. God bless you. So praise the Lord for this man, for being gracious enough to allow me to come do this stream, right? 
That's number one priority. Whether you're in ministry or not, that's number one pro priority. To enjoy Jesus by worshiping him, by loving him, by singing to him, by praising him, by praying to him, studying his word, to hear his voice, to encourage you, to refresh you, to transform you, and to empower you by his spirit, to live a life that pleases him. Because when you please him, you're in his will. He'll preserve you, watch over you. And I'm not teaching faith and works, obviously. Even when you are in disobedience and rebellion, he will discipline you in love, chase you in love to restore you. Because once you're his, nothing in all creation will separate you, sever you from the love of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's the number one priority for everyone, whether you're in ministry or not. So my priority should be I get up and thank the trying God for another day. Glorify the trying God, love and praise the trying God, and ask the trying God to give me the grace to die to my flesh, crucify my flesh, not to be idle, lazy, but to serve Him and worship Him. Right? So that's what I need to do, and all of us need to do it. Now, as part of ministry, what I do is I research. I'll go on the websites, I'll look up YouTube videos, articles against the Christian faith, right? Or I will examine various arguments from various Christian denominations and persuasions, right? Asking the Spirit to help me understand, to sanctify me and guide me all truth. Then write some blog posts and or do live sessions. Thank you, brother. God bless you. And or do live sessions. It's up to you. Okay, if it's still on, yeah. Right? So that's what I do in full-time ministry. Now, some people will be called to just devote themselves to ministry. Some will be called to serve Jesus full-time wherever they're at. We all must serve and love Jesus full-time. Let me just remind you. All of us, number one priority is to worship and love Jesus Christ. So whether we're in full-time ministry or not, we worship and love Jesus full-time. He is our God. He is our life. He's our love. That means if you're working in a secular field, Jesus is your number one priority in your job. You're going to work in such a way to glorify Jesus and bring him praise. Right. If you're in school, likewise, what's up, Cabello? I haven't heard from you in a while. Lord bless you and your precious angel. And may bless my precious angels and all your precious angels in Jesus' name. Yahovah. Father, Son, Spirit. Don't know why it's buffering. May the Lord Jesus bless all of our precious angels, our children, our loved ones, and preserve them in Jesus' name. Okay. So everyone with me there? This is what we do. We serve God every sphere of life. At school, at home, in your relationships, the choices you make. Don't know why this is now buffering here. Can't tell you why. Boy. yeah, I can't tell you why it's buffering here, to be honest with you. I have no clue. Okay, hopefully it's better now. Hopefully it's better. And hopefully in Jesus' name, we'll stay strong. That's ironic because usually his internet is pretty good here. So to now let me repeat why I'm going into this tangent, a tangent. And I pray the Holy Spirit guide the conversation, save me from error, and anoint me to speak the words he wants me to speak to bless you. God was pleased to call me to full-time ministry in 1999. Therefore, all I want to do every day, every night, is to serve Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, and be used of Jesus to bless others, right? Since he's called me to teach and do apologetics, that's the way I can serve you. Every one of you, let me remind you again. Stephen, good to see you. Stephen Atkins, good to see you, brother. God bless you and preserve you. Every one of you, every one of you, if you're born of the Spirit, you belong to Christ, you have a gift or you have gifts from the Holy Spirit. Some of us will have the same gifts. Like David Wood is an apologist teacher, I'm an apologist and teacher. So is Anthony. Some of us will have different gifts. For example, God may have given you the gift of being an intercessory prayer warrior. What do I mean? You can pray for hours for brothers and sisters in Christ, for people in need, for the lost. And it's like minutes. Prayer becomes natural for you. Whereas for everyone else, it's discipline. We got to discipline ourselves by the power of the Spirit to pray. That means that's your gifting, to pray intensely, to pray <clears throat> deeply for the traffic. Okay. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Sorry, guys. This is the best I can do. And we're not even in my brother's house, and it's buffering. This is the best I can do.
I can't. It's beyond my control now, the buffering. I buy the router, and it's in child's home. So some of you also have been give, given the gift, the gift, and I hope you're hearing at least 99% of what I'm saying before it buffers. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we'll trust the Lord to bless the connection for his glory. Some of you have been given the gift of generosity. Some of you have been blessed financially, and God has given you the grace to give that money he's blessed you with to help ministries, to help the poor, to care for the needy, for the widow, right? That's your gifting. God has blessed you financially, give you the grace to give it away cheerfully, sacrificially, no complaints, because that's your gifting. Everyone is gifted by the Spirit if they're born of the Spirit, and everyone depends on the other and their gifts to be built up by the power of the Holy Spirit to attain spiritual maturity until you become like Jesus Christ. Right? You with me there? Everyone has a gifting. Now, my gifting is in finances because I'm not rich. And always growing up, I've had a fear of money. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is sanctifying me, destroying my fear of money. Right? And to trust in Him. Right? Because I grew up. And let, by, by way of testimony, though we were not rich, I never felt poor. Glory to God in his goodness, even as a child, broken family, a dad that wasn't there. I still never felt poor, and I had all my needs met by the grace of the triune God, right? You with me there? So I never felt poor, never felt, though we are not rich. Thank the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And Lopez, may the Lord Jesus heal you, restore you, refresh you. Fill you with the spirit because you have a heavenly father. And I pray that for everyone else who's been raised in broken homes. So I've never <clears throat> felt poor. And even now, I still don't feel poor. And I see God's gracious love and blessing upon my daughters. They don't feel poor and they lack nothing. Glory to you, Lord Jesus, for that love you have for them. Pray for that. But guys, keep praying. Miraculous favor and protection. I, I mean, I really need miraculous favor and protection locally that here people will favor me, work with me, and by the grace of Jesus Christ, allow me to stay. Pray God rebuke those in Illinois, silence those dogs, and remove them so they don't become a hindrance to me because I move in next week, God willing, and I'll be getting internet. Then I can have a set schedule. And at the same time, okay, it's going to buffer here and there. So, Beyond my control, friends. I can't do anything about it. Beyond my control. I don't know why it's buffering here. It's just as bad as my brother's place. At the same time, pray for Protestant and First Last because now they're going to be building up the YouTube page, beatifying my YouTube page, adding thumbnails, comments in the description box, links. They're going to make it as professional as possible, and they don't get paid for this. They're doing it out of the love for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And by the way, I got everyone's noticing my shirt. Superheroes, because growing up, growing up, why am I wearing this? My favorite superhero has always been Batman, okay? Has always been Batman. I love Batman. I've said it, I'm going to say it again. The biggest influences in my life, humanly speaking, whether actual persons or fictional characters growing up, Batman, Bruce Lee, Hulk Hogan, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Bruce Lee having the biggest impact. In fact, I, I have to always guard my heart and ask Jesus to purify my heart, cleanse my heart, sanctify by the Spirit in Jesus' name, uh, that I don't make Bruce Lee more than he is because he was only five foot seven and a half inches, 135 pounds of dynamite, one of the greatest fighting machines, right? 20th century. But because I grew up being influenced by him, I have a hard time seeing anyone defeating him. And I know that's nonsense because he's still a small guy. He's not a God. He's human and could be beaten like any human being, right? But because I found Bruce Lee when I was young, I, I can't imagine anyone beating him. May the Lord Jesus heal my heart and protect me. Michael, you hit it right on the nail. I've always wanted to be a physical fighter, but didn't have the discipline or the talent to do that because I looked up to fighters because that's what I wanted to be. But now God has made me a spiritual fighter. 
He's made me a spiritual fighter. So now I fight spiritually. And guys, here, let me share this with you. So I'm just waiting a few more minutes because I got a lot of links. And maybe First Last or Protestant will then put the links in the description box when it's done. Here. Okay. <clears throat> Believe it or not, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do has influenced my apologetics. I even my my apologetics has been influenced by his Jeet Kune Do philosophy. It's weird. Weird, right? So, but anyway, with that said, yep, yep, we can turn yep, the straight blast and Chi Sao and Pak Sao and Bong Sao. Chi Sao. Bong Sao. Pak Sao. The straight blast. Psst. Whoa. See that speed, suckers? Oh, someone was talking about that. Uh, because I got hit with the flu, little Michael, about a month ago. I got hit with the flu, and it took me about three weeks to recover. As in Chicago, it would have been four days. I've lost all that the, the little muscle I was recovering, the little muscle, because I used to be – because he asked me this. I'm, I hope I'm not boring you. I'm just trying to wait for a few more regulars to show up. Before I got into the Christian faith, I got into bodybuilding and kickboxing. And at my peak, I got – to become 220 pounds of muscle. Flat stomach, didn't have abs yet, it was getting there. I was striated, 56 inch chest, 18 and a half inch arms, right? But I always struggle with narrow shoulders and wide hips. That's why my shoulders, you can see, are narrow. Now, I did everything I can to get a super V taper, okay? And I was so buffed that when I came to the faith, when I came into the faith, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I came into the faith. People then start asking me, now that you're a believer and you won't lie, why don't you admit you used to do steroids? Why don't you admit you used to do steroids? And I never did steroids. Never did steroids in my life. Okay? Now, here's what's ironic. Let me show you what God did. I want to show you something. Yeah, hit the like button, guys. Let's make this go viral and put David Wood to shame. Can, you know, bite my dust. When I was getting into bodybuilding... I made a deal with God. I said, God, if you help me to get muscular out steroids, then I'll never touch steroids. Notice the deal I made. Notice the deal I made. I didn't say, if you help me get muscular out steroids, I'll serve Jesus. At that time, I didn't think Jesus was God. I go, if you help me to get muscular out steroids, I won't touch steroids. Now, here's what's ironic. You want to hear what's funny? God granted me the desire of my heart. I became 220 muscle so that people even till now think I did steroids because they were amazed at my size. And I never did. But you know why God granted me that? Can anyone guess why would God grant such a prayer request that wasn't for his glory? So can someone guess? Why do you think God would grant me that? Think about it. No, you didn't. We just started. Thank you, Turb. Turb, spot on. You hit it. To show me how empty this life is, because though I got to be 220 muscle, I was miserable. I was even more depressed, and I hated myself even more. God was granting that to show me. You see, I can give you the world, and you'll be empty inside, dead inside, and not satisfied or fulfilled. Now, here's what's ironic. I don't have my muscles. I still I still have live handles. I got a corrupt legal system after me, trying to throw me in jail. My family life destroyed. I haven't seen my girls to kiss them and hug them or put them asleep since June. And yet I am more filled. I am more satisfied. I am more joyful. I'm more in love and peace than ever before because of Jesus being real and alive, who is in love with me and in love with you and who dwells in me. By his spirit. See that how what's ironic? I don't have the muscles I used to. I don't have the looks that I used to. I got love handles, right? Nobody loves sandal. <laughs> anyway, haven't seen my daughters since June. I got a corrupt judge of the devil who wants to make my life miserable here. Even here locally, I have to answer to people in authority, and that my my fate here 
lies in God's hands to turn their heart favorably towards me. Struggling monthly to make sure I have enough money to take care of my daughters, get a place, right? Lonely, humanly speaking, going to bed alone, waking up alone without my daughters. And I can tell you, I can tell you, as God is listening to me, spite of that, the Lord Jesus is so real and majestic. He fills me with a peace and a love and a joy that you have to experience by knowing Jesus in order to understand what I'm talking about. That doesn't mean there isn't loneliness and sadness and depression and anger. I fluctuate. But even though I may get angry, there's still joy in my spirit. Even though I may be depressed, I'm still full with love and peace because that's not from me. My emotions is from the spirit. So now, little Michael, why do you care how much I bench? What I bench is I take a box of pizza on my chest, and I can do about maybe 50 reps. Haters. Amazing. Now I'm in, I'm in California. I don't know what that means, George. Okay. Now, with that said, I got some links to share so we can begin. Today is going to be a very intense... Intense, very deep topic. Intense and very deep. We're going to talk about the eternal begetting of the Son, the eternal generation of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has been the belief of the church historically for over 1,800 years. Though there are Trinitarians now that deny it, I'll get into it. So it's going to be very intense, very deep, and it's going to be mind-blowing and perplexing. At museums, Sam's allowed to touch the art, Jack. <laughs> Jack. Right. What movie was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're with me, Jack. <laughs> You're with me, Jack. All right, anyway. You know what's amazing? No matter how much I brush my teeth, because of coffee, my teeth are always coffee stained. I should do commercials. Right. Anyway. Caballo. Do I look like I'm leaner than I was before? Caballo? Even though Caballo is supposed to be helping me over there, she doesn't even care whether I'm in prison or not. It's okay, Caballo. We forgive you. Jack? Jack. All right. Now, here's some links, folks. Start saving them. And first, last, or a Protestant, either one of you, if you can, save the links then and put them in the description box later. Here. I just posted two articles for my blog. Guys, these are must-reading, even if you're not witnessing to Muslims. Thank you, Mickey. Here is, okay, here is the first link. Let me post it one more time. I just posted a response to the late Ahmad Didat. The title is The Mohammedan Fraud That Was Ahmad Didat, Which Bible? Because this argument comes up over and over again, I decided to answer it definitively. Because my response is, yeah, little Michael, who cares about you, dude? Who gives a damn about you and what you believe? Why are you here trying to advertise your heresy? You're a filthy dog. You're a low-life dog. Dogs are cleaner than you. You filthy dog of the devil. Go to hell. Sorry, guys. Where's the love, Sam? I have no love for these filthy, blasphemous sons of the devil. Filthy dog low-life. Trying to butter me up. Hey, uh, how much you bench? Oh, by the way, Jesus had a beginning. Yes. So did your mother. She had her beginning from a dog. Live with it. Don't you love it? Sam, I don't see Jesus in you. Tough luck. You don't? You can go to another YouTube channel. Go to Stephen Atkins' channel or Tony Costa. They'll be loving and Christ-like. I'll just be the jerk like David would. Okay? I don't see Jesus in you, Sam. And it's a... So a guy insults my Lord Jesus, wants to take shot at my Lord Jesus. And when I tear into him and his family, showing him his true origins, I'm not being Christ-like. Sorry, I don't subscribe to that policy. You say anything about Jesus, you're going to offend me. Okay? You rob Jesus of his glory and you blaspheme him. And I'm going to insult you and your mother for giving birth to you. Because Jesus is my God, my Lord, my love, my life. Even though he doesn't need me to defend his honor, 
I get angry when someone chops or tries to rob Jesus of his glory. If someone insults your mother and questions her, you'd be the first to insult that person. But when they insult Jesus, I'll just pray for you, brother. Because as if that was the attitude of the apostles. I'll just pray for you. You just insulted my Lord Jesus. So I'm just going to love you and pray for you. Because the West has produced a bunch of Ivan jellyfish. Uh, saying, official, you want me to now educate you on the Bible? Are you pontificating like a moron? Or do you want me to show you that the same Bible, you have prophets, Jesus, and apostles insulting idiots, morons like you, who think that you can get away with insulting Christians because you've misread the Bible and think we turned the other cheek. Well, I turned the other cheek. I'm out of cheeks. Guess what? I'm not going to bust your mouth, spiritually speaking. Joe W., you don't have more compassion or love than Paul or the apostles, right? Are you more loving than Paul, who prayed God's judgment on blasphemers and perverts of the faith? Here, let me share it with you. Let me show you, Joe W. You ready for the proof? Paul prayed prayers of judgment on people who perverted the faith, hijacked the faith, shipwrecked the faith of people, and handed them over to Satan so that Satan would punish them. You guys want me to show you those verses? You want me to show you those verses, guys? Josh Lester, you don't like it, go to hell. Oh, no, no, better yet, go to Hades. See? Sorry, not hell, Hades. Hell is your future. Yeah, baby. Psst, psst, psst. All right, now, 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 20. Sir, 1 Timothy, like I said, this channel is not going to be for everyone. And guys... Those of you who can handle and tolerate and are sincere and want to learn, I will serve you till I die or until the Lord Jesus tells me to stop. I'll serve you. But if you're here, if you're here and you don't like the, the way things are done, get lost. Take a hike. I don't want you here. I don't know how much clear I can make it. Now look at this moron idiot. Isn't Hades a Greek god? No, Hades was your mother. Send Cynthia official out of here. Yeah, exactly, Elizabeth. We need Christians to be warriors in the battlefield. Enough of this sissy, wishy, washy, effeminate Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. Enough of the wishy, washy, sissified Christianity. Enough. Yes, I ask God to make me more loving and patient, but I'm balancing you guys out who are too kind and compassionate thinking you're being Christ. Okay? First Timothy 1, 18 to 20. Enough, man. I'm getting sick of it. If enough Christians were warriors, right, and how they treat blasphemers, then my attitude wouldn't be something shocking or surprising. It would be normal. It would be normal. First Timothy 1, 18 to 20. Let's see how Paul... You can't say you're more filled with the Spirit than Paul or know Jesus more intimately than Paul, right? Or on a higher level than Paul spiritually. Now, let's see how Paul tolerated people, okay? 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. This instruction I entrust to you, my child Timothy, in harmony with the prophecies that were made about you, that by these you may go on waging the fine warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have thrust aside. Pay attention now. Some have thrust aside the faith, resulting in the shipwreck over the faith. Hemenaeus and Alexander are among these, and I have handed them over to Satan so that they may be taught by discipline not to blaspheme. Let's read 1 Timothy 1.20 one more time. Now look at the nine-headed dragon demon monster, quoting Paul out of context. You mean the same Paul, you six-headed Demon that just said, I handed him over to Satan to be disciplined. So you're going to pit Paul against Paul, you moron. Send this nine-headed dragon to his father. Okay. 1 Timothy 1.20. Guys, here you go. 1 Timothy 1.20. Hamenaeus and Alexander are among these, and I have handed them over to Satan 
so that they may be taught by discipline not to blaspheme. Paul, but the fruit of the Spirit is patience and love and kindness, Paul. I don't see Jesus in you, Paul. Okay. Second Timothy. Second Timothy 2, 16 to 18. Second Timothy 2, 16, 18. So I'm going to repeat after this one more time. Okay. But reject empty speeches that violate what is holy, for they will lead to more and more ungodliness. And their word will spread like gangrene, like a disease, like cancer. Again, notice who he mentions? Hemenaeus. And now someone else. Philetus are among them. These men have deviated from the truth, saying the resurrection has already occurred, and they are subverting the faith of some. Notice he mentioned Hemenaeus and his doctrine being spread like gangrene, like a disease. What does he say God should do to these people? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. What does Paul pray God do to these people? Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm. Now he's quoting the Joe Witness Bible because that's what we're using to prove our position. Jehovah will repay him according to his deeds. Does that sound like a blessing? Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him according. That's a prayer, an imprecatory prayer. God will damn him for what he's done to me. You too should be on guard against him, for he opposed our message for an excessive degree. Now, you evangelifish, sissified Christians, explain to me Paul's attitude here. Go ahead, explain it to me. Would any of you pray, may God damn that person who hinders my ministry, blasphemes Jesus, and prevents people from hearing the truth? No, you'll say, no, brother, that's not Christ-like. Shame on you, because that's what Paul did. Right? Don't pretend to be spiritual. You're not. You're a fake. Let me say it out loud to you fakes. When you think you're humble and that you're compassionate and gentle and you're Christ-like, no, you're a fake. You're a spineless coward who has no courage to take a stand for Jesus and get beat up for him. Don't play that. I'll just love you, brother, and I'll be. Yeah, I'll just pray for you. Get out of here, man, you cowards. You sissified evangelifishes disgust me and embarrass Christianity. Right? Honestly, you do. Okay? Let me give you a final example from Paul. Acts 13, 6 to 12. Yeah. Wherever Paul preached, riots happened. And by the way, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. The word evangelifish was coined by the late Robert Morey. That's where I heard it from. He used to call these sissified, these sissy Christians, evangelifishes. Acts 13, 6 to 12. And he was absolutely right. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they, not, they met up with a Jewish man named Bar-Jesus, who was a sorcerer and a false prophet. He, has, he, ha, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. Calling Barnabas and Saul to him, this man was eager to hear the word of God. Now watch. Here's a man eager to hear the word of God. Okay. Now watch what happens. Okay. <clears throat> Verse 8. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for that is how his name is translated, began opposing them, contradicting them, trying to refute Paul's message, trying to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul also called Paul, becoming filled with Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now fills him to do what? The Holy Spirit fills Paul to insult and curse this demon. And the Holy Spirit filled him to do it. Notice verse 10. And said, O man, full of every sort of fraud and every sort of villainy, you son of the devil, you enemy of everything righteous, will you not quit distorting the right ways of the Lord? Job is not in the Greek text. This is a provision by the Job Witness Bible. Now watch. Then the pro, okay, and look, the Lord's hand, the word Job is not in the New Testament, shame on the Job's witnesses, may he, Destroy that organization and save these people from their blasphemous perversion of this Bible. Right? Look, the Lord's hand is upon you. 
and you will be blind, not seeing the sunlight for a time. Instantly, a thick mist and darkness fell on him. Then the proconsul, on seeing what happened, became a believer, for he was astounded at the teaching of the Lord. Of the Lord. The Greek is the Lord. Kyrios. No, Ted, you are a son of a dog. You are a son of a pig. You filthy dog lowlife. Yeah, baby. Ron here, are you like trying to pit Matthew 5 against me again? I was very loving when I said that. Do you want me to show you the same Jesus insulting people, Ron here? Because I know you're not quoting that against me, right? I know you're not trying to misquote Matthew 5, 44 against me. I know you're not doing that, right, Ron here? Jack, you got a problem with that, buddy? Which part of you don't like it? Take a hike wasn't clear. I don't want people like you here if you can't handle it. Get out of here. Go somewhere else. There's a lot of YouTube pages. Yeah. Ron Hare, are you trying to misquote Matthew 5.44 and pit it against me? I just want to know so I can correct your misinterpretation. Sorry, guys. It seems like school is in. Okay, because you know, Ron Hare, that the same Jesus rebuked and chastened severely insulted the religious hypocrites, right? Right? You know that, right, Ron? Matthew 23 is an example. But let me give you one example, just one. You guys, for those of you taking notes, for those of you taking notes, write, write Luke 11, Luke 11, 37 to 52. Luke 11, 37 to 52. Just write that down because we're not going to read all of it. Now look at Luke 11, 45 to 46. Luke 11, 45 to 46. I know Ron Hare is a regular. That's why I asked. That's why I didn't. See, notice I didn't shoot you out, Ron, because I know you're a regular, and that's why I wanted you to clarify. Why would you quote that? Luke 11, 45 to 46. In reply, one of those versed in the law, notice this. One of, the verse, one of those verses in the law said to him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. Now, notice what Jesus didn't say. Oh, did I hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. I wasn't being Christ-like. You know, Jesus loves you. Is that what he did? Notice. Then he said, woe also to you. Oh, you don't like it? Woe to you. Tough. Where's the love, Jesus? Didn't you say love your enemies? Where's the love, Jesus? So I get sick. I'm going to repeat it again so that people come here. I am sick and tired of the sissified, effeminate evangelifishes. If you don't like my approach, I didn't invite you here. Please be my guest. Get lost. Go to another YouTube page. I'm just being honest. My style may not appeal to you. That's fine. Someone else will. Go there. Don't come here and tell me what you think of the way I'm doing things. I'll answer to my Lord. May Jesus have mercy on all of us and forgive us. Okay? Because I don't want to waste time explaining there is a time and place to ridicule, insult, mock, and shame filthy, wicked dogs. That's what the Bible calls them. Swine, sons of the devil. And I'm using biblical language. I'm using biblical language. Okay, is that clear now? Now that we got rid of the distractions, can we focus now? Guys, let me repeat again. If God has put grace in your heart to be able to tolerate me, let me repeat this. I will serve you guys. I will love you guys imperfectly because I'm not perfect. I will teach you guys to the best of my ability by the power of the Holy Spirit until Jesus says stop or I die or the Lord comes down. But if you don't like my approach, don't come here. And especially don't come here to say you don't like my approach. Get out of here. I'm not for you. Okay? That, I mean, I don't know how much more clear I can make it. I'm hoping the day will come by the grace of God. Only those who can tolerate such a personality will come. So I don't have to keep doing this. I want to change to be more like Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, please, we beg you. In any area we're not like Jesus and we grieve you, save us from that. To delight your heart in Jesus' name. Okay. And again, I want to give credit where credit is due. 
Robert Morey, who's now in the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he's the first one I heard using the word evangelifish because he was disgusted at the sissified effeminate Christians. Okay? You want me there? He was disgusted. I don't blame him. Early on, I thought I had to talk a certain way because I was afraid of backlash. Finally, by the grace of God, I woke up and said, who gives a damn if Western sissified evangelifishes think I'm too harsh and I'm not being Christ-like? You don't like it? Take a hike. Go to Hades. Not hell. Go to Hades. The church needs more men. Your church fathers, your spiritual ancestors, the Athanasiuses, the Justin Martyrs, the Rainuses, were not sissies. They were warriors who faced soldiers, who faced <clears throat> men in authority, the emperor and lions boldly and died as lions, lionesses, warriors for Jesus Christ. In fact, this is a tradition of the church. You know St. Nicholas where we get Santa Claus? You know where St. Nicholas where we got Santa Claus? Google this. It says, at the Council of Nicaea, when Arius, the heretic, was denying the deity of Christ, he jacked him in the mouth. He couldn't control it. Though Athanasius was refuting him, St. Nicholas got upset, couldn't handle it, and jacked him right in the mouth. And then the tradition says he was thrown in prison. And you know who appeared to him, according to the tradition? The Lord Jesus and his blessed mother appeared to him to encourage him. Do you know that tradition? I know the Catholics and the Orthodox know that tradition. You know that, right? Yes. The tradition says when he jacked Arius in the mouth, thrown in prison, and it says in prison he had a vision of the Lord Jesus and his blessed mother. Now, if I were to jack a Jehovah's Witness in his mouth or Muhammad Hijab, who wears niqab, that sissy in the mouth, you'll say, stay away from Sam, he's not a Christian. Right? So S Santa Claus was very naughty. He wasn't nice. Now, for those of you from the Greek Orthodox or the Orthodox background Catholics, can you confirm the story? This is a tradition. Am I making it up? Check it out. So, guys, please, for the love of the triune God, I'm saying this, and I, I hope God crucifies my flesh, saves me from my sin, my flesh. Okay, listen to me. If you don't like my style, that's fine. You can go somewhere else. But don't come here and tell me you don't like my style. I don't care for your opinion. If I'm wrong, the Holy Spirit will convict me and change me for the glory of Christ. I'm my, my trust is in the Holy Spirit. He is my God. He will save me from myself, not to shame Jesus. But if you can, by the grace of God, tolerate this person, this way of preaching, I will invest all my time into you for the glory of Jesus, to be used of Jesus, to bless you, to understand the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So I hope that's clear. If anyone tells you it is not biblical to pray judgment on blasphemers, dogs of the devil, do me a favor one more time, Protestant believer. Quote it in the King James. Quote it in the King James. 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 and 15. Okay. 2 Timothy 4 and the King James, 14 and 15. Okay, watch here. Watch how Paul prays. Okay. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. 14 and 15, not 16. I know you like to give me more. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Guys, honestly, I want you to answer this. 2 Timothy 4.14, Paul says, This Alexander who harmed me and opposed me, the Lord reward him for his works. Is that a prayer of blessing? No, jo Joey, you stupid moron. See, you're another dog. See? Okay. 
Was that a prayer of blessing or prayer of judgment? Was that a prayer of blessing or judgment? When he says the Lord reward him for what he's done. Okay. So where do you get you Christians, you evangelic fishes, and you know who you are, one in particular who's here, who's now silent, probably left because he doesn't like my style, that it's not biblical to pray judgment on those who blaspheme Jesus, who try to destroy the faith of, of people, mislead people into lies and falsehood, and try to hinder you from preaching the gospel. Where do you get it's not biblical? But Jesus say, pray for your enemies. Yes, everything has a time and a season. Everything, there's a time to pray for your enemy and a time to pray for judgment on your enemy. Who told you it's either or? It's both and. Trust the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to guide you. When to pray for your enemy's salvation or pray that God will deal with him and remove him. Clear? Okay. That's clear. Let me give you the links. I have a lot of links. Lots of links. Here's the link again. Save it. This is a link to my new post today where I answer the question posed by Ahmed Idat. Here's where I need you to listen. Ahmed Idat tries to attack the authority of the Bible because of the different canons. The Protestant Old Testament contains 39 Old Testament books. Yes, you can pray, Angela. God saves someone out of heresy. And if not, then the Lord deal with him and give him what he deserves. Of course. Okay. Focus now, fo folks. Focus. Thank you, Ron Hare. Lord Jesus bless you and preserve you for his glory. You won't get this in mainline denominational churches. No, because they become sissified. They become effeminate. Men look like women. Skinny jeans, disgusting. Anyway. That's the link. Let me explain these articles. Please click on the links, study the articles, print them out, use them in your studies and in your witness. One of the arguments that Ahmadidad uses to try to prove the Bible is not authentic, he pits the Old Testament canon of the Protestants with the Old Testament canon of the Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics have 73, I'm sorry, yeah, 73 books altogether. They have 46 books in the Old Testament. Protestants have 39 Old Testament books. So his argument is, which of you have the correct number of books? And he does this to get people to doubt the Bible. I respond to him from the Quran, his source of authority, even though he's dead and damned and under the feet of Jesus. And he did. if he didn't repent, he's burning with Muhammad, that false Antichrist. Okay. Now pay attention. This article I, you need to study it, use it in your witness. For a Muslim to ask this question, he or she is either ignorant of the Quran or dishonest. Why? Because the Quran says, and the evidence is in that article, use it to silence this objection. The Quran says, you Muslims, if you want to know the Old Testament, if you want to know the revelations given to the Jews, you go to the Jews, not to the Christians. You ask the Jews about their Old Testament. You ask the Jews about their sacred history. You ask the Jews about the revelations that God gave them. So if they want to know the Old Testament, they ask the Jews because Muhammad in the Quran is telling the Jews of his day, God entrusted you with the scripture and prophethood and preferred you above all creatures. So God gave you his revelations. So I'm to ask you about your history and your books. Once you do that, the Jews at Muhammad's time and the Jews today only accept 39 Old Testament books. So Didat, shut your mouth. Stop using this objection because you're a liar and deceiver. You want an Old Testament? You go to the Jews and they'll tell you at the time of Muhammad and now only 39 Old Testament books. Now, let me explain. That doesn't mean Christians can't have these debates. Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorian Protestants, we can have these in-house debates among ourselves regarding the Old Testament, right? We can argue because 
all the major branches of Christianity except the 39 Old Testament books. We all agree on that. It's the additional books that we dispute. So among Christians, we can have these debates. But for a Muslim, his Quran tells him, go to the Jews to know what the Old Testament is. And it is a historical fact. It's a historical fact. Pay attention. Historical fact. At the time of Muhammad, and even now, the Jews only accepted the 39 Old Testament books. They didn't accept the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonical. So that means the Quran has already settled the issue for Muslims. The Old Testament canon of the Jews, those are the books that God sent down for the Jews. End of story. Stop bringing this objection, Zachariah, or I'm going to humiliate you and your prophet. Everyone there? You understand why you need to study this article? If you're witnessing the Muslims? Okay. Here's the second article for today. Sorry, I'm too loud. Some people don't like it when I'm loud. I'm loud. Did I give you that? Oh, hold on. Okay, I gave you the wrong one. Here's the link. There are two articles. Here's the link to that one. Which Bible? Silencing Ahmad Didat. There's the link. Which Bible? Silencing Ahmad Didat. Now, here's the link to the other article I posted today. I've written a series of articles proving from the Arabic of the Quran. Listen to this, folks, because they like to attack the Bible in the way it depicts God as, quote, unquote, changing his mind, repenting, or Jesus not knowing the dare hour. Well, guess what, folks? I've written a series of articles proving from the Arabic Quran that Allah is an ignoramus. He doesn't know everything. He hopes that things will turn out the way he wishes they'll turn out, and he guesses from the Arabic Quran, showing that this objection by Muslims can be used against their God to show their God is an ignoramus. He's a false God. Do you hear what I said? And here's the article. So please click on the links, save the articles, study the material, pass them on, teach them to Christians, and use them in your witness to Muslims. Okay? Everyone got it? If you got those links, now to the topic. And we're going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Send Lane out here, please. Lane just said, it's Jehovah the Mahdi that Muslims are waiting for, blaspheming the true God. Send, send him out of here. Okay. Now for links. The topic is the e eternal begetting of the Son. What does it mean that Jesus is begotten of the Father? Are we ready? Because I got about six articles for you to save and store and study. Well, you click on the link, Lopez, and what you can do is bookmark the page. Or click on the link, copy and paste the link, and save it somewhere. Okay. Okay, now, are you ready for the series of articles on the question of, is Jesus Christ begotten? And what does it mean? Who's ready? Because I got about six articles I got to give you, and we go into the meat of the matter, because I'm going to have to do a second part, obviously. Okay, first article. First article. This is an article on the Greek word used, monogenes. Monogenes, and I'll comment on that. Monogenes. Article number one. Save that link. And first, last, keep tabs on the links. Maybe later on in the description box, you can put the links there with my Patreon pages as well, if you're able to. Okay, that's one. That's the first article. Second article, the only begotten son. O managenes, we use, we use. Here's the second article. Guys, second article. Article number two. Okay. Okay. Third article. Third one. A lot of meat, a lot of links, a lot of information. I have to go slowly. Third article. Here it is. This is the third one. Okay. Here's the fourth article. Fourth article, post, article post. Denny Burke, B-U-R-K. I keep misspelling his name as B-U-R-K-E. Denny Burke, okay? That's the fourth article, 
Keep up with me. I think it's the fourth article, right? All right. One second. Oops. What happened here? Sorry about that. Let me just make sure. So I want to check something out. Yeah. One second. I just need to check. So this will give you time to save the articles. Here's the fifth article. Fifth article. Same guy, Denny Burke. I counted five. Yeah, it is five. It's the fifth article. This is the fifth article. I'm right. Yes. Right. Two articles from Denny Burke and three articles from other authors. Michael Marlowe was one. Right. So this is the fifth one. Okay. Now. We're almost done. This one is the sixth article by Wayne Grudem. And I'm going to come back and revisit this. Wayne Grudem. It's B-U-R-K. I used to think it was B-U-R-K-E. These are all evangelical apologists, scholars, or theologians. That's who they are, Christian. Which doesn't really mean much. You can be a scholar and still be a false Christian. Anyway, that's the sixth article by Wayne Grudem. G-R-U-D, like day, E-M. I'm going to come back to that. And now, I believe, the final article. Hold on one second. I know it's not. You know what? No, it's not the fine article. There's two more. Hold on. Yep. Again, another article by Denny Burke. Sorry. Three articles by Denny Burke. Here you go. This is now the seventh article. Seventh article. Folks, please save them and God willing, they'll be in the description box after the session is done. Now the final article. Charles Lee Irons, and I'm going to talk about the background, okay? Here's where I'm going to need your undivided attention for the glory of Jesus as the Spirit fills us, protects us from error, blesses the session for the glory of Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Guide us. Crucify our flesh. Fill us with fruit, life, power, wisdom, knowledge, love, and faith from your presence, Holy Spirit, and wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. All right. That's the final article, Charles Lee Irons. Okay. We're going to be talking about the Greek word, monogenes, and I'm going to explain in a minute. Now, here's where I'm going to educate you on the history of this term. So sometimes it won't be as entertaining, but it will be educational by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Up until the 1900s, listen to me. Here's where you're going to need to listen. Why you can't trust any human authority, but you trust completely, wholeheartedly, the triune God. You put perfect trust in the God-man, Jesus Christ. Because scholars, apologists can be wrong and mislead you, including myself. Here's the Greek word transliterated, monogenes. Up until the 1900s, native Greek-speaking Christians and even those Christians who, let's say, worship God in Latin, right? Because remember, the New Testament was written in Greek, translated in various languages, one of which was Latin. And Latin became the official language of the Western Church. The liturgy of the Roman Catholic Church is in Latin. Scholastic writings were in Latin. So in the West, Latin became the language of philosophy and theology in the liturgy. Whereas in the East, it was Aramaic slash Syriac and or Greek, right? As well as Arabic when they adopted Arabic as a language. You with me there? Okay, now, up until the 1900s, and you'll find this in the writings of the church fathers, the word monogenes was always understood to mean only begotten. Manas genes. Manas means one and only, right? Genes comes from genos, which comes from genomai, right? Genomai. And genes was understood to mean begetting or birthing. Only begotten. Unfortunately, in the 1900s, a Christian evangelical 
quote unquote scholar named Dale Moody. Dale Moody wrote on the use of monogamy and convinced scholarship in the West. Okay, now watch. Listen to this. This is where I need you to listen. Convinced scholarship in the West that the word monogamous doesn't mean only begotten. And he influenced scholarship to drop the word begotten as part of the definition of the term. That's why translations done after his research, with the exception of the New American Standard Bible, and the exception of the modern English version, right? <clears throat> and New King James Version, all your translations render monogenes as one and only or only. Are you with me there? You understand what this man did? He wrote something on monogenes, convincing scholars it doesn't mean only begotten. Then another scholar after him named Richard Longeniker, Richard Longeniker came and... <clears throat> reaffirmed what Dale Moody said. So these two scholars, because of their influence, changed the opinion of Western scholars, evangelical scholars, or just Christian scholars or, who are just liberal, changed their view in that they no longer accepted only begotten as an accurate translation of the word. Everyone with me there? Before I move on, okay, that means for 1,900 years, they want us to believe for 1,900 years, the Greek-speaking fathers whose mother tongue was Greek, who spoke in Greek, slept in Greek, woke up in Greek, read Greek, wrote Greek, were wrong. Were wrong. You with me there? So that means 1,900 years of Christian scholarship and belief, they were wrong. All because of the influence of Dale Moody and then after him, Richard Longeniker. You with me there? That's what it basically saying. But God has a sense of humor. And by the way, before I got that, because I too studied these scholars and influenced by them, when I started reading, let's say, Daniel Wallace or Richard Longeniker or even what James White wrote, in Forgotten Trinity, I too became convinced monogamous doesn't mean only begotten. And I too, in my earlier articles, wrote, quoting these scholars to show it doesn't mean only begotten. Now let me tell you why God has a sense of humor. Praise God for this man, Charles Lee Irons. Here it is. Let me give you the link to that article one more time. Charles Lee Irons did a massive search in the Greek database because they have a database where they collected Greek papyri, Greek writings before, during, and after the time of Christ. And he has now conclusively demonstrated. Guys, listen to this. Thank God for this man because now he's conclusively demonstrated the word genes does mean to give birth so that monogenes does mean only begotten. And because of his research, he's now changing the opinions of scholars back to the view that it means only begotten. You know what that means? The church fathers were right. All the articles I gave you are in defense of monogenes, meaning only begotten. That means the Greek-speaking fathers, Athanasius, you were right. And now you're in the presence of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Irenaeus, you were right. Justin Martyr, you were right. Polycarp, you were right. Augustine, even though Greek Orthodox don't recognize, you were all right. Dale Moody and Richard Longeniker were wrong. Dale Moody proposed that monogenes does not mean only begotten. Okay. So now, because of the influence of this man, let me give you this link again. Wayne Grudem, Wayne Grudem, okay, watch here, Wayne Grudem, you should know this man if you're an evangelical, he wrote one of the best systematic theologies, it's called systematic theology, Wayne Grudem is one of the world's leading evangelical scholars, theologians, 
And he actually teaches here in Arizona. Okay. Because of this man's research, scholars like Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology, and Bruce Ware have changed their opinion and now agree with him. They agree monogenes means only begotten. And here's the proof. This is from Rain Grudem. Click on the link. Here's what you're going to find. Let me show you what he says. Okay. Let me show you that part of his article. And I met him on two occasions and I asked him the question. Notice what he says here. More recently, forthcoming Lee Irons' paper on monogenes has only begotten. He's talking about the research of this man that's now published. Notice what he says here. Notice what he says here, folks. Okay. Look at this part. Let me try to get all of it if I can. Okay. Let me do this. Look what he says here. Forthcoming Lee Irons paper on monogamous only begun. Extensive TLG search. That's the database that has all these Greek literature. Persuasive analysis. Persuasive analysis. Analysis. Now notice what he goes on to say. Now watch here. Look what he says. Oops, sorry. I got to break it down. It won't work. Okay. Watch here. Look what he says. My conclusion on eternal generation, I am now willing to affirm the eternal generation of the Son based on John 1, 14, 18. Those are the texts that call him monogamous. As something mysterious not implying creation of the Son, begotten, not made, and somehow analogous to human father-son relationship. Okay, now you know why that's important? Not only is Wayne Grudem one of the leading evangelical scholars who thought that monogenes did not mean only begotten, he's also part of the translation committee of the ESV, English Standard Version. This word monogenes, let me show you how they translated in the ESV. Do me a favor, Protestant. Post John 1.14 and John 1.18 in the ESV, English Standard Version, of which Wayne Grudem is a part of. He's part of the committee that translated it. Okay, well, follow me, guys. A lot of meat today. A lot of meat today. Notice the English Standard Version. Wayne Grudem is on the translation committee. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son. The word, the only son in Greek is monogeneos. Monogeneos. Okay. Monogeneos. Notice how they rendered it. They rendered it as only son. There is no begotten. John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God. Now, you guys see the words only God? The Greek is monogenes theos. Theus. Theus. Theos. Did you notice again they didn't translate monogenes as only begotten? They translated as the only. Did you catch it? Wayne Grudem was part of this translation committee. At that time, he didn't believe that the word monogenes meant only begotten. Everyone with me? You're receiving. Seminary level education for free folks. You don't get this stuff even in colleges. At least I don't think you do. And by the grace of God's spirit, because of the grace, mercy, goodness of the Holy Spirit, you're learning this for free. That's why I want you to pay attention and learn. Okay. I met Wayne Grudem on two occasions. I personally went up to him and I asked him, is it true you change your position on monogenes? Do you now believe monogenes means only begotten? He goes, yes. I was wrong, basically. And monogenes does mean only begotten. And he says in the updated edition of the systematic theology, he's going to change that section and admit monogenes means only begotten. And then he asked me a question. He goes, should we also change it in the English Standard Version? I go, absolutely. You need to. So he said... When they update the English Standard Version, they're now going to change it to only begotten. You caught it now? Scholarship is now returning to what the church has always historically believed. 
The word monogenes means Christ is the only begotten son. Only begotten son. And let me sum it up with the words of Denny Burke. Let me sum it up with the words of Denny Burke. This article, which I gave you the link to, the last paragraph, look what he says. Look what he says. I love what he says here. Watch here. It turns out that the Nicene fathers knew Greek really well, probably better than any of us reading the New Testament today. I think that the interplay between Monogenes and Genao in the creed, the Nicene creed, shows that the Nicene fathers noticed the interplay of those same terms in John's writings. They were interpreting the Greek Bible in the creed, and they were and are right. Jesus is the uniquely generated Son of God, begot not made before all ages. Wow. You think? The fathers were right, and these scholars were wrong. Michaela, you're either reading the King James Version or the New King James Version or New American Standard Bible or Modern English Version. Which is it? Which one are you reading? Yep. Ron Hare, the King James Translation was right. The Church Fathers were right. The Latin Fathers that translated Monogenes, Monogenes, in Latin as unigenitus, which means in Latin, uniquely born. They were all right. Dale Moody, you were wrong. Richard Longenecker, you were wrong. And you influenced scholarship and led them into your error. Now, what did you learn from here? For those of you who didn't fall asleep. You cannot trust human authorities, human scholars, and give them your absolute devotion and trust. We are humans. We are imperfect. We can be wrong and mislead people, whether intentionally or unintentionally. The only perfect teacher of the word is the triune God. The only perfect man is Jesus, the God man. Right? So don't fall prey to anything or everything a modern scholar tells you. Folks, your King James translation was right. Monogenes means uniquely born, only begotten. They were right. Everyone with me now? Now here what's, uh, what's ironic. Both the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church swear by the Nicene Creed. Even Protestants, Protestants recite the Nicene Creed. But due to Western scholarship, Western scholarship, Marcus, why do you bark like a dog when dogs can't speak human language? Your mother should be arrested for giving birth to a dog like you. Okay. Anyway, let's come back here. Okay. The Western Church, because it's been influenced by Western scholarship, do you know that the English translations of the Nicene Creed, even done by, let's say, Roman Catholics, don't translate monogenes in the Nicene Creed as only begotten, but as only son? Whereas earlier we were looking at the English translation of the Nicene Creed by the Greek Orthodox Church. And in their English translation, the Orthodox still translate monogenes as only begotten. Do you know that? In fact, here, I know Jai did it for me on Discord. First, last, can you do me a favor? Can you search on Google Nicene Creed Roman Catholic version? Can you do that for me? Give us the link and then quote the part where it says, In one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son. If you can do that first and last, or somebody, anyway. And then we're going to talk about what it means for the Son to be begotten. This is all preparatory, because I have to do another session, I believe. I have to do one on this tomorrow, if you're okay. Because we're still going to use the Jehovah Witness Bible to prove the Trinity. Okay? That's still the aim. But I have to lay down the foundation. Okay. 
Here is the Roman Catholic version of the Nicene Creed in English, right? In English. Am I correct? If so, post the part where it says, and we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. One Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what the LOL is for. Right? I don't know what happened. Maybe I did something that was funny. Watch here. One Lord Jesus Christ. If he posts it before the rapture. You there, bro? Okay. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Did you guys catch it? The English translation of the Roman Catholic version, Nicene Creed, didn't translate. The Greek is monogenes. The Latin is unigenitus. Notice, due to the influence of Western scholarship, like Dale Moody, they don't even translate it as only begotten anymore. Even though the next line says, eternally begotten of the Father. Do you see how even this scholarship has affected the Roman Catholic's understanding of monogenes? Do you see it? He just posted it. Now let's post. Look, first and last, do me a favor. Look for the English translation of the Nicene Creed by the Orthodox Church. By the Orthodox Church. Right? And then we're going to go into the biblical basis for it. What does it mean that Christ is begotten? And when Lord, one Lord Jesus Christ, did you catch it? The Orthodox render it only begotten Son of God. They remain faithful to the definition of monogenes. Same creed. Same creed. Yet the Roman Catholic translates it only Son. The Orthodox translated as only begotten Son. And the Orthodox are right. Do you guys see it? Before I move on, I hope this is blessing you. I honestly hope so. All this studying, I pray that the Spirit will sanctify my heart, that I do it because of my love for Jesus and His church. You, I study so I can serve you. I hope this is blessing you. It's not boring you. Yeah. Did you know what else I learned? You know what else I learned? When I went to that Greek Orthodox church, just by God's grace, because I wasn't planning to. I was going to a Greek festival. When I went inside the church and observed their Vespers, they had English translations of the Bible. Guess what version? The New King James Version, their primary one, and their secondary one, the King James Version. The Greek Orthodox only go with the New King James Version or King James Version of the New Testament because the Orthodox Church follows the Byzantine text, the majority text, from which we get the King James New Testament or the New King James New Testament. Do you know that? I even took a picture. Here. Well, even if I send it to them, they won't be able to post it. Okay. They won't be able to post it. I even took a picture in the church. I'm going to send it to Protestant and First Last. I don't know what good that will do because I can't show it to you. Maybe I can. Hold on. And I don't think they can post it. Here it is. I just sent it to them. I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if you can see it. Yep. Oh, you can see it. That's good. Hold on. The light's in the way. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. Hold on. Let me turn off the light. One second. It says New King James Version. Let's see. Okay, hold on. Okay. Now, now you should see it. Do you see? It says New King James Version. Come on, man. Oh, oh, sorry. It went off. Sorry. New King James Version. Let's see. New King James. See? There it goes. You see it? New King James Version. That's what they use. The Greek Orthodox, the Orthodox churches, when it comes to the English, they use the New King James Version. 
They even produce what's called the Orthodox Study Bible. The Orthodox Study Bible. In the Old Testament, it's a fresh translation of the Greek version of the Old Testament. But with the New Testament, they went with the New King James. They didn't even translate it. They simply took the New King James version of the New Testament and made it part of their Orthodox Study Bible. The Old Testament is a fresh translation of the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible because they go with the Greek version, the Septuagint. But when it came to the New Testament, they chose the New King James Version. Here, I know you guys don't believe me because you think I'm a heretic. Here you go. I'll give you the link. Orthodox Study Bible. Here you go. Here you go. Right here. This is it on Amazon. They use the New King James Version for their English New Testament. Why? Because they believe that the Byzantine manuscripts, the Byzantine text, what's known as the majority text, the majority of our Greek witnesses that have a higher degree of agreement, are superior to the earlier papyri. And so they prefer those manuscripts. And they went with the translation that's based exclusively on those manuscripts. That's the New King James as well as the King James. Right? Orthodox. Now, let me show you what their New Testament. Orthodox, study Bible, New Testament. There you go. Let me do this over. I hope you're learning a lot. I really do. There you go. The Orthodox Study Bible, and I have both of them in my library, but they're boxed up in storage. Here you go. I have both of them in my library. Click there. That's their Orthodox New Testament and Psalms. And if it, I think it'll allow you to open up, and you'll see it's the New King James Version. Okay. Before I move on, yeah, because they three 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 Vedan, because they go with the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, they'll have Psalm one fifty one. So the Orthodox Study Bible has study notes from an Orthodox perspective. The Old Testament, they translated it directly from the Greek version of the Old Testament. The New Testament, they didn't provide a fresh translation. They simply went with the New King James. Now, honestly, I'm here to serve you, so I want to give you information that will bless you. Honestly, this hasn't bored you yet. Have you learned a lot thus far? Because, look, we cover several topics in one session. Even though I want to talk about eternal beginning, we started about, is it right to pray judgment on blasphemers and insult them? So, so far, it, you've been blessed. You're challenged. You're being excited and refreshed by the power of the Holy Spirit as he saves me from error and sanctifies all of us to become more like Jesus for the glory of Jesus. In all honesty, how many places you can go to to get this kind of information, this kind of detail? All glory to the triune God for his favor and mercy. Everything good from him. Okay. Now, with that said, why is it important to affirm the eternal begetting of the Son? Now that I laid the groundwork, now I laid a foundation, we can now build on it by the power of the Holy Spirit using the Joe Witness Bible to prove our position. Now, here's the thing, though. I have to state up front, not all Trinitarian Christians and scholars believe in the eternal begetting of the Son. Again, due to the rise of modern scholarship and the rise of modern versions, okay, we now have Christians who are now <clears throat> shying away from or are ignorant of the fact that the historic faith of the church is that Christ is the eternally begotten Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. In fact, due to the rise of modern scholarship and modern versions, when's the last time, if you don't go to, let's say, a liturgical church, let's say you don't go to an Orthodox church, or if you don't go to a King James only church, or a church that uses, let's say, the new King James Version, When's the last time you have heard in your church the pastor called Jesus the only begotten Son of God? 
I'm not talking about independent fundamental Baptists who go to King James only churches. Put you aside. I'm not talking about Orthodox churches, right? Or even those who go to a Roman Catholic service where they recite it in Latin. Well, they're here in Latin. Talking about you who are evangelical Christians who go to churches that are not liturgical, that don't recite, let's say, the creeds, that follow modern versions like the NIV. When was the last time you heard the man of God from behind the pulpit say, the only begotten son? Yes, Matthew George. The Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament, and the Greek-speaking Christians went with the Greek version, not the Hebrew version. Do you know why Chris LaSala calls him begotten? Because he follows the King James Version. Anyone who doesn't follow the King James or the New King James or doesn't go to one of these liturgical churches like the Orthodox or the Coptic, right? Roman Catholicism, you'll hear it because it's in the creeds. You'll be hard-pressed to find any of these, like, say, mega churches, right? Saying Christ, the only begotten Son. That language is slowly disappearing from our vocabulary in the West. And that's mainly due because of the rise of modern versions and modern scholarship. In other words, Christians are being severed from their historic roots, the belief of the church historically that Christ is the only begotten Son, eternally begotten of the Father. Everyone with me there? Yes, medic, exactly. Because of that, you now have Trinitarian scholars and apologists that don't believe in the creeds when it says Christ is eternally begotten. One of the most famous of which is William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig does not believe Christ is the eternal Son of God let alone the eternally begotten Son of God. And he does not believe the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. He believes that this is outdated language that should no longer be used today because it miscommunicates. Did you know that? That's just a fact. I'm not making it up, TBI. Don't take my word for it. Search William Lane Craig, the eternal begetting of the Son. William Lane Craig believes that the language of the early church and the creeds, creeds, outdated language. We shouldn't use that language anymore. It will miscommunicate. And he doesn't believe Christ has always been the Son. Now, he's a Trinitarian. He believes the three persons of the Godhead are eternal. They've always existed as one God. They are the three souls of God, eternal. But the Father wasn't the father before creation. The son wasn't the son before creation. All three persons existed before creation, existed eternally as God, but they were not father and son. These are roles and titles they took after creation. Right? Yep, Guy Wilkerson, that's what he believes. But Guy Wilkerson, he's not alone. Walter Martin who wrote the book, The Kingdom of the Cults. Walter Martin believed Jesus is eternally God, the eternal word of, the, of God, uncreated. He was a Trinitarian, but he believed that Jesus only became the Son when Mary conceived him in her womb by the Holy Spirit. So they'll tell you that before creation, Christ is the eternal word. And there you had God, the eternal word, and the eternal spirit. But he wasn't known as the Father, and Jesus wasn't known as the Son before creation. But Charles, you're not paying attention. They're not denying that Jesus is eternal, Charles Dickens. They're saying he wasn't the Son before creation, though he's eternal and did exist before creation. You with me there? Everyone understand the rise of modern scholarship and modern versions have severed many Christians from their historic roots, the roots of their faith. So that now you have them saying the church fathers were wrong. 
The Council on Nicaea was wrong. Athanasius was wrong. Augustine was wrong. Irenaeus, they were wrong. They did what they could to the best of their abilities to communicate the Trinity, but they did so in language that's outdated and we shouldn't follow their example anymore. You know what the implication of that is, right? No, no. Elizabeth, you're still not getting it. It's not God as three beings. He's one being, three persons, three eternal persons of God, but they were not known as the Father and the Son before creation. Survivor by Jesus Christ, Son of Man is not the Son of God. So you're confused. You guys are all over the map. You're not understanding. You understand the implication of all this? It means that God allowed the church for 1,900 years to get the relationship of the members of the Godhead wrong. They were wrong, and God allowed it. Maybe he did. You hear me there? So, folks, we're living in some dangerous, sad times, right? Scary times, and that even those among us who are Trinitarian, who worship and love the Trinity, believe the Bible is God's word, believe Jesus was born of a virgin, died and was raised physically, bodily, and he reigns in heaven, will return physically and bodily. They are also starting to believe things and introduce things that goes against what the church believed historically, but they think they're doing it because they're now more faithful to the Bible and have a better grasp of the Bible than our spiritual forebears. So, one thing about apostasy, let me explain the danger of apostasy. Let me explain the danger of apostasy. Satan doesn't simply come up and cause you just to reject every aspect of the faith to damn you. What he does is he slowly, methodically starts to chip away at the core doctrines of the faith so that the apostasy is slow and subtle and not in your face. Because in the early church, if someone like William Lane Craig denied that Christ is the eternally begotten son, he'd be condemned as a heretic thrown out of the church. But look at the day and age we live in where now we can basically articulate any view of the Trinity and it's acceptable and we don't question that person's orthodoxy. No sweet tea with a dash of lemon. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. Who told you the Old Testament is God's revelation of himself as father? Yeah, okay. Anyway. All right. Let's come back here and focus on the point. Yeah, I'm just going. This is all preparatory. I'm lay laying the foundation. I'm preparing you for why these are important doctrines. And I, let me just say, I'm not saying these men are not believers. God forbid I would say William Lane Craig is not a believer. William Lane Craig is an amazing philosopher, apologist, used by God to destroy atheism, demonstrate God exists, and that Jesus died and rose again. So God bless him for his work. But William Lane Craig, because he's too influenced and affected by philosophy, is willing to discard Many of the core doctrines that define the church historically. So I'm not saying he's not a believer. But the things he says will impact and influence modern Christians so that in a generation or two, if the Lord doesn't come in our lifetime, Christians won't even be using this language anymore. And the only ones who will be using this language are those who go to apostolic churches, meaning not oneness heretics, like Orthodox churches or Coptic churches or they are be the only ones left that believe it. You with me there? But the Western church will no longer be speaking of eternal begetting of the Son, eternal procession of the, son, of, the, of the Spirit, no longer reciting the creeds, the Nicene Creed, because they'll say that this is all prehistoric, outdated. No. Gabriel, why would the Holy Spirit have a separate throne from the Father and the Son?
Let me answer that question. TB, TBI, James, it's not so much he's compromised. He believes this is what the Bible teaches. So he's going with the Bible and his understanding of the Bible and saying that what the father said is not biblical. It's outdated. So he doesn't think he's compromising. With me there? Yes, I would, Shamir Solomon. King James, New King James, or Modern English Version? Jesus, the position for creation. Uja, the historic position of the church is that Christ was begotten before creation. Yes, that's what they believe. That's what they taught. That's what they wrote. It's in the creeds. Okay, so, so far, this is all preparatory. I'm laying the groundwork, which means you have to go back and re-listen to this, because when I do part two tomorrow, using the Jehovah Witness to prove the Trinity and the eternal beginning of the Son, and what it means and does it mean, I don't have to repeat all this. Yeah, send trolling on a revolution in Russia somewhere, maybe in Siberia. You want me there? Well, Michaela, believe it or not, there are Roman Catholic apologists that condemn William Lynn Craig as a heretic. I know of one apologist named David Armstrong, who's a convert to the Roman Catholic Church, and he says outright he's a heretic because he denies the store Christian faith about the eternal beginning of the Son and that Christ has a true human, rational soul. So there are some who do condemn him as a heretic. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I can't go that far. Why can't I go that far? Number one, God doesn't care for my opinion. Even if I were to condemn you, who cares? God may condemn me, God forbid. But number two, he still affirms the Trinity. He affirms there are three eternal persons of God. And Jesus is one of those eternal divine persons who's always existed as God. And he affirms that Christ is generally human, with a human nature and a physical body. And he affirms that Jesus is the God-man. And he affirms that Jesus was born of a virgin. And he affirms that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And he affirms that Jesus was raised physically, bodily to life. And that Jesus reigns in heaven and will return as the God-man. Because of that affirmation, I cannot say he's not a Christian. I can't. Me personally, I can't. Yeah. Someone quoted the Old Testament where Jesus is said to be the son of man. That's not the same as calling him the son of God, Daniel. That was Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Okay. You get my point? So I am not one who would question a Trinitarian's Christianity. I'll say he's wrong and I disagree with him and he's mistaken, but it doesn't mean these are damnable mistakes. In my view, in my view, it doesn't matter. So I won't go that far. As long as you're a Trinitarian, you worship and love the triune God. You believe Jesus is the God-man. You believe he was born from a blessed virgin by the Spirit, no man having touched her sexually. You believe he died on the cross for our sins and was raised physically bodily and will return physically bodily. Then, to me, all right, that's good enough for me to see you as a brother, though I disagree strong with you on these other issues. That's me. That's my position. Okay? That's my position. But if you deny the Trinity, even though evidence is given to you that God is a Trinity, and deny that Jesus is the eternal person who became flesh, one divine person with two natures, or deny the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus, or his physical bodily resurrection, then I question you whether you're a Christian. You want me there? That's my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I'm not God. I'm not inspired. My opinion means nothing. You're sharing my opinion. Okay? Unlike Dave Armstrong, who's a Catholic apologist who condemns him as a heretic. Do a search. Dave Armstrong, William Lane Craig, heretic. I, I can't go that far. Not me. But let me just tell you up front. I do affirm the Nicene Creed. I do affirm the eternal beginning of the Son, and I do affirm the eternal procession of the Spirit from the Father alone. In the Western Church, due to the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, there was a clause added to the Nicene Creed where it says, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
Historically, the creed did not say he proceeded from the Father and the Son. He proceeds from the Father, period. I don't know about... Okay. Buffering again. Eric, Eric, listen to what I just said. I just said I believe in the creed that Jesus is eternally begotten, begotten son before creation. So listen, I'm answering you. Sorry, we're buffering again. Answer the other question. Okay, to answer the other question. Here's my answer. Can there be a Jehovah's Witness who doesn't understand the Trinity, doesn't know the Trinity, so he rejects a false representation of the Trinity, not the correct view of the Trinity, and rejects a false misrepresentation of the Trinity, whom Jesus can show mercy and forgive? Yes. Jesus is almighty, right? I make a distinction between someone who's been given hard evidence for the Trinity from the Bible, whose objections have been refuted, and still insists the Trinity is unbiblical. That person is now willfully rejecting the evidence that refutes his heresy and demonstrates God as a trinity. That person is a different story. Everyone with me there? Uja, why aren't you patient, brother? Why are you rushing me to get to the subject? Can you be patient because patience is one of the fruits? You want me to drop everything and just get in the topic? Be patient. Allahu Akbar. No, Matthew, George, don't use Hebrew 7.10. Stop with the false analogies. Just focus, be patient. Just focus, be patient. I'm preparing you. I go slow so it can sink in, so you can understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll get to what does it mean for him to be eternal begotten. Okay? But everyone, we're on the same page now? Are we on the same page now? Dominus telcum, depending on which Roman Catholic you ask. If you have pre-Vatican II, old Latin mass type Roman Catholics, then yes, Protestants are schismatics and heretics. They're not separated brethren, right? It depends on which Roman Catholic you ask. Because delcum, uh, is that how you pronounce your name? You even have Roman Catholics that are what are called set of acantists that believe that even the current popes are anti-popes used of the devil and that the seat of Peter is vacant. So depending on which Roman Catholic you ask, and you even have Orthodox who would consider Roman Catholics to be heretics, false Christians, as well as Protestants. And you have Protestants who think Roman Catholics are false Christians and Orthodox are false Christians. In fact, someone told me they unsubscribed to my YouTube channel and I told them, get lost, take a hike, you ignorant, arrogant, self-righteous swine, because he's saying I'm too compromised like vocab is because we believe there are true believers in all the major branches of Christianity. And he thought he hurt my feeling because he unsubscribed. He's like, I go, get lost, you wicked, self-righteous swine. You get it? So you have Protestants, independent fundamental Baptists, Calvinists who think Roman Catholics, Orthodox, they're not saved. You have Roman Catholics who think that about Protestants and Orthodox. They're not saved because they're schismatics and heretics. And or every branch of Christianity has a group that considers all other Christians to be fake, false, under God's wrath. And then there are among them, those who say no, they may not have the fullness of the truth. They have enough of the truth to show that they are believers, brothers, and sisters in Christ. All major branches of Christianity have that. In fact, you have on my channel, Roman Catholics listen to me, Orthodox listening to me, and Coptic. They're here because they think, though I may not have the fullness of truth, I'm not part of the true church, I'm still a brother in Christ, born of the Spirit, used of God. You get my point? Guy Wilkerson, 
You're not patient either, bro. You've been here long enough to be patient. You want me to just let's jump all this and jump into it. Okay. Patient. I just want to make sure everyone's getting it. We got to get it to 160. Come on, in Jesus' name. All right, hit that like button. Okay, with that said, with that said, okay, are you ready now for a definition? Me too, Charles Dickens. I Let me tell you my background. I was raised among independent fundamental Baptists, reading Jack Chick tracks, Alberto Riviera, and then I became a staunch five-point Calvinist, and I really had a fear and a dislike of the Roman Catholic Church because I thought the Jesuits were behind everything, corrupting everything, infiltrating all spheres of life in Protestant churches, and that the Pope is the Antichrist. Even though I don't like the current Pope, let me be honest. Sorry, Catholics, I don't want to offend you. This Pope, man, the seven, he, he, he's, he, he really makes a strong case for set of vacantism. Loosen up, man. The guy's bad. Even the Catholics are embarrassed by him, right? So I grew up out of that tradition. What tradition? A tradition that taught me Roman Catholics are deceived. The Pope is the Antichrist. They're evil. They're all lost, right? And I used to be scared of Roman Catholics, and I used to be scared of Jesuits because I thought they infiltrated everything everywhere. They are working with the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, and I also bought into the black pope. Not that the pope was a black man, but they're supposedly that there's a real pope who's called the black pope, who's behind the scenes, who works with masons and tells what the pope should do. You with me there? That was my background. And I became a very paranoid schizophrenic Christian where anyone who walked in the church, especially if he was white and came out of nowhere, my first reaction is that man must be a plant, an Illuminati plant, a Jesuit spy. Yep. I was paranoid because I bought into Bilderbergers, Illuminati, right? Weishaupt, right? The bankers. Right? And I was paranoid. Paranoid. Then finally, by the grace of God's spirit, I got convicted. And then I said to myself, what the heck am I paranoid about? Okay, think about this. If this is all predestined, that means these things must happen. And these things must happen for Jesus to return. Why am I so paranoid? Why don't I just focus on Jesus and glorify him? And that's when the Lord set me free. Because if you believe, this is all prophecy. One world government, one world leader, the Antichrist, and these organizations are working together. Why then are you paranoid? You should rejoice. They're fulfilling prophecy. Hello? They're bringing about the return of Christ. So then it dawned on me. Why am I so paranoid? And then the Lord set me free. So now when people talk about the Illuminati, they go, here we go again. Bilderbergers, oh, here we go again. Let's bring out the violin. The Jesuits, yeah, yeah, yeah. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the Society of Jesus. He started the secret society who swears allegiance to the Pope, and he's behind everything and everyone. <laughs> Clear? All right. With all of this as a background and as a foundation, remember, I'm going to have to do a part two. Don't think this was wasted. This was necessary background information to lay the foundation because we're going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and the eternal beginning of the Son. So I have to do a part two because I'm just going to briefly touch on what does it mean the Son is eternally begotten? Okay. I was a deadly gripe. I really was. And it didn't help because a friend gave me a set of tapes on the Illuminati, left me paranoid as, <laughs> I was going to say as hell, paranoid, man. Let me just tell you one real quickly, one story. I was attending an Assyrian, Assyrian evangelical church, and I would teach two Bible classes 
a week, Thursdays and Sundays. And the pastor was a godly Assyrian evangelical who went to England to get a degree to be a pastor. And he taught at a seminary. Because of my paranoia of the Illuminati, I actually thought he was an Illuminati plant raised up by the Illuminati, sent in as an Assyrian evangelical to try to destroy the Assyrian Christians. And I got paranoid and scared of him. You believe that? That's how paranoid I got. And I would start drilling him on questions. Hey, uh, you went to England, huh? Yeah. But you were in Syria, weren't you? Yeah. Who took you to England? He goes, oh, some British missionaries. British missionaries. Oh, good to know. And then who sent you from England to America? Good to know. That's how paranoid I was. That's how paranoid I was. I swear I was paranoid, man. Now, I'm not lying. It is so disgusting and ridiculous to get consumed by the conspiracy theories because you start losing focus on Jesus and trust in Jesus and you create a paranoid atmosphere where you're paranoid about everything. What? Serious. So now I am so disgusted and turned off when people talk about Illuminati, right? I, I'm, I'm, I, I go, here we go. All right, I'm gone. I don't listen to it anymore. Right? And I'm also now disgusted with all these latest fads, latest signs, blood moon, right? Like that guy, Khan, whatever his name is, that supposedly Jewish rabbi. I'm sick of all that too. Disgusted with all that too. Because it makes Christians look like idiots. It embarrasses Christians. And gives unbelievers an excuse to attack the Bible and Christianity as anti-intellectual. So I'm done with it. Done with it. Okay. In Jesus' name. Now, with that said, yeah, Jonathan Khan. I hope so far everything we've discussed on when is it time, when is it right, and when is, it, is there a time to insult people, mock people, ridicule people, and pray for God judgment on them. I showed you that. Yes, there is a time. Ask the Spirit to show you when that time is, right? And now I went into the history of the word monogenes, only begotten, showing you the church fathers were right. The evidence shows they were right. Modern scholarship was wrong, right? All these other issues. I hope it blessed you. I hope it challenged you. I hope it per blew you away, like perplexed your mind, like blew your mind away. And now you're all the better for it because now you know your faith on a much deeper level, level by the power of the Holy Spirit. With that said, let me explain the term eternally begotten. And Lord willing, I'll go into the biblical basis more in depth tomorrow if God wills. Right? If God wills. You with me there? Let's not get into side issues about Illuminati because, again, if you believe the Illuminati, what, do you, what can you, okay, here, for those of you who believe in the conspiracy, can you tell me, for the love of the Lord, what are you going to do to stop it? You're telling me this is prophecy. You're telling me this is prophecy. So the Illuminati is a necessary evil that God has prophesied, must come to power to bring the Antichrist. So then why are you paranoid? What can you do about it? Are you going to stop God's prophecy being fulfilled? So you're trying to now <clears throat> falsify God's prophecy? You get my point? The people are into paranoid. Why are you paranoid? You're telling me it's prophesied. That means the Illuminati must come into power to bring the Antichrist. How are you going to stop it? So why are you paranoid about it? Let them do what they do. Let them be busy doing what they're doing. You be busy loving Jesus, worshiping Jesus, glorifying Jesus, enjoying Jesus, living for Jesus, and preaching his gospel. Right? Right? Because you're telling me this is prophesied. How are you going to falsify it? How are you going to stop them? Are you nuts? Right? I mean, that's when it hit me. The Holy Spirit convicted me. What? Hold on, Sam. This is prophesied. How are you going to stop it? So let it happen because then Jesus comes. I go, oh, yeah. What's wrong with me? Okay. Right? What's wrong with me, man? Prophesy, 
In fact, I should be rejoicing. Thank you, Illuminati. Thank you, Bilderbergers, because you're going to bring it, bring in the return of Christ. So hurry up. Get to it. Form that world war one world government. Bring the Antichrist because Jesus is coming down. So thank you. And then I focus on worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus, living for Jesus, preaching Jesus, and they can be focused on what they're doing. God will take care of them. Let me be busy about the kingdom. Let me be busy about spreading the kingdom of Christ, the rule of Christ in the hearts of people. Right? Make sense now? Okay. What does it mean eternally begotten? Eternally begotten. Everyone with me now? Eternally begotten. Here's what it doesn't mean. When the church fathers meant Jesus is eternally begotten, they didn't mean that God created Jesus from nothing, brought Jesus into being from nothing. Okay. As the centuries be, went on, the church fathers finessed, fine-tuned their understanding of what it means for Jesus to be begotten of the Father. So number one, it doesn't mean God the Father brought Jesus into existence, into being, created him from nothing. That's not what they believed, okay? That's in the creed, by the way. Do me a favor, first and last. Post that part of the creed where it says, In one Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of God, begotten not made, begotten before the ages. Okay, yep, Mark Blitz and John Hagee as well. Watch here. God bless you, soldier. You can hear the rest of it later on, and I'm just going to do another 10 minutes. Not John 1 1. We're not talking about John 1 1, sweet tea with a dash. Not John 1 1. Even though it's going to be used in support of the eternal begetting of the Son, but that's not it. Okay. Now, First and last, post that part of the creed. Because historically, the Philoke was added later on to the creed, as even the Orthodox and the Coptic and the Assyrian churches will tell you, right? And secondly, the Bible nowhere says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Even though the Bible doesn't speak of their ontology in great depth, in the economic trinity, the way the trinity works in respect to redemption, you see it, the Son sends the Spirit from the Father, and it says he proceeds from the Father. Oh, he left? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know he left. Sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, let me find the, that part of the creed. Sorry about that. Okay, let me find that part of the creed. Did he say he's coming back? I know Protestant believers here, right? Watch here. There you go. Here's the link. Here's the link. I won't be able to copy and paste it, but I'm just going to give you the link. Here you go. Oh, you did? Sorry, brother. I didn't see it. Okay. Thank you. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Begotten, not created, being of one substance with the Father. Okay. Everyone understand? The Christians did not mean that the Father produced Jesus from nothing, created Jesus. No, Jesus is eternal, uncreated in nature. He's an eternal person. Begotten of the Father, but not in time, where the Father then produced the Son, brought the Son into being. Begotten eternally, a timeless reality. Okay. Let me show you a passage that I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Yes, I believe it's so. Yes, it is. Yep, it is. I believe so. Yeah, Orthodox, you're right. Assyrian. Okay. Let me give you a passage to keep in the back of your mind. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. Love you too, Lopez. Love you all. Love you, Ben, for the sake of Jesus. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Listen to this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord Jehovah. By the way, use now the Jehovah's Witness Bible, Protestant. We're going we're gonna to stick with the Jehovah's Witness Bible to prove our point. Yeah. Well, David Shelton, it's a little more technical than that. I'll get into it. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, declares Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So notice what you need to put in your mind for tomorrow's session, God willing. Study this passage, read it, and reread it, and reread it, and ask the Spirit to ingrain it in your heart and your mind. God says, my way of doing things is not the way you do things. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. The way I do things are higher than the way you do things. In other words, just because when human beings beget, that implies a moment in time that doesn't transfer over to God. God begets in a different way from his creation because his ways are higher and greater than our ways. You may beget in time, meaning when you beget, that requires a moment of time. But don't apply, apply the time factor to God. Just because God begets doesn't mean he do so, does so in time, in a moment of time, because the way God acts and the way he begets is different from the way creatures bound to time do so. You understand what you're supposed to take away from this? You understand? What I want you to be focusing on as we discuss it tomorrow, okay? Yes, relationship. God's ways of doing things, his begetting is different from the way creatures bound to time do things and beget. You do things in time, so your actions are bound by time, right? Before and after. That doesn't transfer over to an eternal being, an eternal reality, and eternal relationships when time doesn't play a role. Are you with me there? You with me? So Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 will be the guiding passage. I'm going to refer to it over and over again. My ways of doing things is not the way you do things. My way of doing things is not the way you do things. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So when God says he begets, don't assume he begets like you. He doesn't beget physically. He doesn't beget sexually. And he doesn't beget in a moment of time. When it comes to the eternal relationships of the Godhead. Right? Is it making sense? I want to make sure you get that point. If it's making sense, quick definition and one example, and Lord willing, we'll do part two tomorrow. Okay. By eternal begetting, the fathers meant that, and by the way, the Orthodox and the Catholics can correct me if I'm wrong. So please chime in and let me know where I'm wrong. Because this is a reality that's beyond my comprehension to fully understand. Okay. It's beyond my ability to fully comprehend. Okay. What they meant was that the deity of the Son, the divine essence of the Son, the son, the essence that the Son possesses is the essence of the Father that he shares in common with the Father because the Father is the source of the divine essence. He's the source of deity and all the divine attributes. So the deity of the Son is the deity that the Father possesses, which the Son shares in eternally inseparably. So the Father is the source, and the Son possesses that divine nature in union with the Father because it's the Father's essence that he shares fully and completely. So the Father's essence is the Son's essence, is the Spirit's essence, but the Father is the source of that essence. Who didn't get it? This is why the early church fathers believed in something called the monarchy of the father. The monarchy of the father. You know what they meant by that? The father is the fountain, the source of deity. The divine essence originates from him and in him. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why he's also called the Father. The divine essence originates in and from the Father. And the Son's essence 
and the Spirit's essence is the essence of the Father that they perfectly, fully possess and share in eternally. Why would it be material? See, there you go again, guy. Which part of Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 wasn't clear, guy? Didn't I just not say, don't impose your understanding of these terms on the Godhead? How can it be material when God is immaterial, guy? You just did the very thing I told you not to do. al Masihu Akbar, al Masihu Akbar! God bless you, Eric. And watch over you. God bless you, all of you guys. On the super chat, God bless all of you. Thank you for your support and love. Okay? Did I not just get done saying, don't assume God does things the way you do, and God did that exactly. So is that essence material? How can it be material when God created all matter and is immaterial by nature? El Mustodit, not necessarily. See, this is what happens when you give analogies. That analogy of H2O existing in three states is not necessarily modalistic. Let me explain that. You know why El Mustodit? Because H2O can exist in three states simultaneously, and they're not identical. If you ever go to a lake when it's cold, you'll see there's water, liquid, then there's solid, the ice, and then steam, vapor. So you can have all three states of H2O existing simultaneously, and they're not the same state. So it's not necessarily a modalistic analogy. Now you see why it's not modalism, though, medic? Because liquid is not the same state as solid. Solid is not the same state as vapor. And you can have all three states existing simultaneously, as H2O, but in different states. That's not modalism. Okay? But why are we talking about analogies right now? Uh, Chess, because you're a moron and an idiot and stupid, you don't realize that you can extract principles from statements that may not be addressing that issue. Don't be that stupid and pontificate because you're an idiot who doesn't know the Bible. So shut your mouth, okay? So when God begets, he begets like you. See how stupid you are? These guys who think they know the Bible. Kill me. No, you think you're God, but you are a demon who I'm going to muzzle for being stupid. Send them out of here. And you wonder why I can't tolerate these fools who think they know the Bible. Sorry, guys. You come and pontificate. Like an idiot, then I'm going to cut you down like an idiot. Stop commenting on things that you're not qualified to comment on. You don't like the channel? Go somewhere else. I just said it over and over again. Okay. I don't know how much more. I mean, do I need to say it every session? What a moron. Because that's thought about his plans, you can't extrapolate a principle from that passage and apply it to other things. You see what a stupid guy. And I hope he's not a teacher of the word of God. But that's how he's going to argue. For the rest of you who are listening and serious, are you benefiting from the discussion so far? You guys benefiting so far? Okay. Okay, now coming back to the issue. What does it mean that the Son is eternally begotten? It means that the essence of the Son is the essence of the Father that the Son shares in fully and eternally inseparably. So the Father is the source of the essence that the Son possesses and the Spirit possesses. Right? You understand what it means? So if you ask the church fathers, right, what distinguishes the Father and the Son of Spirit? You know what they would tell you? They'll say the Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Spirit proceeds or is breathed out. You with me there? Let me repeat again. The Father's called God the Father, the unbegotten God, in contrast to the begotten Son. And they distinguish the Spirit from the Son and saying, the Spirit wasn't begotten, but breathed out. 
Now notice the brilliance of their minds, how they're playing on the words. Because in Hebrew, ruach can refer to spirit, breath, or wind. And the Greek word pneuma means spirit, breath, or wind. So they took that. Wait. So the spirit is like breath that God breathes out. But the son, right, is like a child that God gives birth to. You understand the brilliance of their minds? How they took the language, right, and ran with it. So the spirit is not the son. He's the spirit. That means his relation to the father is different than Jesus. Jesus is a son begotten, not made. The spirit is breathed out by the father. Spiration without ever severing from the father. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. God bless you. Who's not getting it so far? Who's not getting it so far? Anyone confused? Anyone confused? Because I'm going to give you an analogy and we're going to unpack it tomorrow. We're going to unpack it further tomorrow. Okay. In Hebrew and Greek, 01, the word spirit can mean breath, wind, or spirit. Breath, wind, or spirit. Okay. So because the spirit in Greek is pneuma and in Hebrew is ruach, and it means breath, spirit, or wind, the fathers then understood from that that the spirit is like God's breath that's breathed out. See, you breathe out breath, but you don't breathe out a child. You give birth to a child. So they saw these as God's way of communicating how the son relates to the father in a different manner from the spirit. The spirit is breathed out without separating from God, and the son is born. You see how they understand the language. How many times do I need to say it? Allahu Akbar. I'll say it again. Okay, one more time. One day said, Christ is begotten of the Father. What they meant was that the deity, the divine essence that Jesus possesses, is the Father's own essence that she, Jesus possesses and shares in eternally, inseparably. But the Father is the source of that essence. That divine essence comes from, originates from the Father that the Son and the Spirit share in. To give you a biblical analogy that's limited and finite. Eve, where did she derive her essence from? Eve, the first woman, where did she derive her essence from? This is not exactly like God. So don't say I'm saying this is God. I'm just giving you an analogy that's limited. An analogy of finite temporal creatures just to give you an idea of something that's beyond this. Eve was taken out of Adam's side. So notice Eve's human nature originates from Adam. Her human nature came from Adam. Adam is the source of her human nature. And because her nature originates from Adam... She derived her nature from Adam. She is of the same essence of Adam, so she can't be inferior to Adam. You with me there? And in one sense, Eve was already existing in Adam because notice, God didn't create Eve from dust. He took her out of Adam. That means she was in Adam as a part of Adam, and then brought out of Adam to be a distinct person. And I'm not saying this is exactly the case with God. I'm not saying this is how God is as a trinity. So don't misquote me and misrepresent me. I'm giving you an example of a finite human creation that's unlike how God is. But just to wrap your mind around. You with me there? You getting it? Eve was in Adam, comes out of Adam, partakes of Adam's essence and nature. And because she comes out of him, she's from him, she has his nature, which is why she's equal to him in nature, dignity, and value.
And in one sense, she was always in Adam, right? Because she came out of him. But she wasn't in him as a dif distinct person. She came out of him, and then she became personally distinct. This is why this analogy can't ca carry over to God, because Father, Son, and Spirit have always existed eternally as persons in relationship. See how deep the Bible is? How amazing the Bible is? How mind-blowing the Bible is and the God of the Bible happens to be? So what's the point? The Father is the source of the divine nature. The Son's divine nature comes from the Father's essence because it's the one essence of the Father that the Son and the Spirit eternally share in all its fullness. So the Father's deity is the Son's deity is the Spirit's deity, and the Father is the source of that deity. Graciala, God oh, bless you. Clear? Yes, medic. That's one of the examples I want to give tomorrow, God willing. Yes, medic. That's one of the passages. Right? Now, let me give you the best analogy. The best analogy. And then we're going to wrap it up in tomorrow's part two. Again, I want to get take a moment. Thank you, guys, honestly. As long as you can tolerate me and put up with my imperfections and pray that God will make me more like Jesus and purify me to be holy and pure and love with Jesus and worship Jesus and obey Jesus, and he continue fills me with wisdom and knowledge and the health I need and save me from any corrupt decision from a corrupt judge of the devil, grant me favor here, provide for my daily provisions to take care of my daughters. I'll be here serving you, teaching you, loving you as imperfectly as I do, Trusting the Spirit to use me, to bless you, to fall more passion love with the true God of the Bible, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So I want to thank you for allowing me to serve you and bless you. Obed, for now, I usually try to come on around 2, 3 o'clock, 3, 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time until I move in my new place, God willing, next Monday and get internet. Then I'll have a set schedule and everyone's going to know it. But pray for that especially for favor with the local people here, the authorities here, that they'll always favor me and work with me, not against me in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to give you the best analogy, an analogy that the church fathers ran with. It comes from Hebrews 1.3. Um, and I'm thankful and grateful for all of you, King of Kings, all of you. I love you for the sake of the Lord. I really mean that. I may be harsh, cruel, but I do love you guys. I do. And it's because of Jesus. Jesus puts love in my heart for you because he says, if you love me, you'll love my church. And I want to be in love with Jesus. Okay, now, Hebrews 1.3 from the Jehovah Witness Bible. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. There you have it right there. There you have it. I don't know if you caught it. There's the eternal generation. Notice, Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and he is the exact copy of God's being. Did you catch it? Whose being is Jesus the exact copy of? Whose being does Jesus share? God the Father's. And Jesus is whose reflection? God the Father. There you go, eternal begetting. It's right there. But let me break down the language of reflection. Reflection. Oh, this is a Trinitarian channel. Refuting cults like Joe's Witnesses. Come on, Elias. I've been talking about the Trinity. That word reflection of God's glory. The word reflection in the Greek, it only appears one time in the New Testament. It's apo. apo yeah, apo gosma. Yep. I think I'm misspelling it. Let me just double check. These Greek words. Oh, you Greek guys. You and your Greek. Let me see what it is. I think I misspelled it, but let's see. Hebrews 1 3. Apogasma. Apogasma. It's only used one time in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, I misspelled it. See? I knew I misspelled it. Here you go. Here's the link to the Greek. Here's the link from the Greek. It's apo, apo, or apo, 
Gazma. Okay. Apogazma. Now, you know what that word means? Let me explain to you the significance of this word and how the fathers use this to show that the Bible teaches that Christ is eternally begotten. Apogazma is the reflection or a light that shines forth from a shiny object. It's the word used in reference to the sun, S-U-N, that radiates light to us. It's the light that comes out of the sun or a shiny object. Now, you understand the implication of that? Radiance. Like the sun in the sky, we see its radiance. What is its radiance? It's light that's bright that comes to us. Now, understand the beauty of this analogy and how amazing this Bible is and the way God inspired th these books of the Bible. Get ready to be blown away. The sun in the sky radiates to us light, bright light. That's the radiance of the sun. Number one, the light originates from the sun. But because it originates from the sun and comes out of the sun, the light is of the same essence of the sun. It can't be of a different essence. The light of the sun and the sun are made of the same substance and essence. And yet the sun is the source of the light. It's the one that radiates the light. But the sun cannot be the sun without its light. If at any time the sun doesn't have light, it's not the sun. The sun, to be the sun, always has to have light that it radiates. Otherwise, it's not the sun. It becomes a supernova. You understand the analogy between father and son? Jesus is the light that shines forth from the Father, the Father being the source of that light. And yet, because Jesus is the light that shines forth from the Father, he has to have the same substance of the Father because he shines forth from the Father. And the Father cannot be the Father without the Son. So just like the light of that shiny object, the sun in the sky, comes forth from the sun, is the radi radi radiance of the sun, and because it comes out of the sun, it has the same substance of the sun, and the sun cannot be what it is without the light. It always has to have the light to be what it is. The Father always has to have his own son to be what he is, even though the sun shines forth from the Father, the Father being the source. Did you catch it? So that Greek word refers to the radiance, the outshining of a shiny object. So the sun in the sky, S-U-N, radiates light, shines forth light. The light is the radiance of the sun that comes to us and we see it. But because it originates from the sun, it is of the same essence of the sun. And the sun cannot be what it is if it doesn't have light. If it doesn't have light, it's not actually a sun. That's the analogy right here. The father is the source of the son's deity. The sun shines forth from the father. He's the father's radiance. Because he's the father's radiance, he has the same substance of the father. But for the father to be who he is, he's always had the son. Yep, exactly, TBL James. The heat is that fire of the Holy Spirit. Exactly, Anna Groin. The early church fathers used the analogy, analogy and they're getting it from Hebrews 1.3. It's not my analogy. It's the analogy of the fathers based on Hebrews 1 verse 3. Did you catch it? Did it make sense? Who's who's confused? Because I gotta I gotta end it. Who's confused? Remember, UJ, you're you're talking in modern scientific language, which was unknown to the first century and the subsequent centuries of the church. They didn't talk chemical reactions. They saw light and they felt the heat. God material. Guy Wilkerson, brother, I don't know what's why you're having a hard time. I don't know if I need to block you because I don't think you're following along. 
The word substance is that Greek word, hypostasios, that's used in Hebrews 1.3. Because, again, you don't learn. I don't know if you're being arrogant now, guy. Just because your substance is material, why would God's substance be material? Did you not get Isaiah 55, 8 to 9? Why are you causing trouble, brother? Because your substance is material, God's substance has to be material. Why that stupid connect? Come on, brother. Why are you dropping the ball here, guy? I love you, man. Why are you making it hard? Which part of Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 wasn't clear? His ways, his thoughts are not your ways, your thoughts. So your substance is material. Why does God's substance have to be material or physical? I thought I started this by hammering the point, but you're not getting it, guy. So what can I do for you? How can I help you? To speak of material, we'll miscommunicate because we think of material as matter. But substance isn't necessarily material. Are you getting it, man? Guy, come on, brother. Help me to help you, bro. What's not clear? God's substance essence is not like created substances and essences. But the word hypostasios that's used in Hebrews 1.3 can mean substance, essence, or being. But the substance of God is not material. It's not physical. The being of God is not material. It's not physical because he created all matter, time, and space. ESV doesn't translate only begotten. Monogene says only begotten, Bill Thompson. They're translating a different word, ganao, as begotten. Ganao, as begotten. You want me there? Guy, help me to help you, man. Come on, it's not hard, bro. Stop understanding God from your temporal finite perspective. Just realize you can use the same word for God and it doesn't have the same meaning. God's substance, your substance. Your substance is physical, material, temporal, and finite. God's substance is not material. It's not physical. It's infinite and uncreated. Stop trying to bring God down to your level and define terms in reference to God the way you define them in reference to yourself. Stop that, Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Okay. Well, that said, this session is over. God willing, tomorrow we'll go into the biblical basis for the eternal beginning. Realizing not all Christians agree with me. Realizing that Christians will say that I'm misinterpreting these passages, like William Lane Craig, or even a guy named Steve Hayes from Triblog, because they reject these doctrines. Doesn't mean they're not Trinitarian, but I reject their rejection of the doctrine. They're wrong. The church fathers were right. That's what the Bible teaches. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh to the glory of the Father in union with the Spirit. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, sooner than later. Wash us in your blood. Seal us in your love. Fill us with the Spirit. Save us, my daughters, our, our loved ones, for your glory, Lord Jesus, and provide for us and save me from this corrupt, wicked system in Jesus' name. Guys, pray for miraculous favor February 13th, Thursday and February 19th. God shows up miraculously and protects me, gives me favor here, and I stay here. With no worries. Please, guys. And Lord willing, I move into my place this weekend. Pray for the provision. Love you guys. Lord willing, tomorrow, look for me around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, around that time. God willing, we'll do part two of this. Using the Joe Witness Bible to prove the core doctrines of the Christian faith. And remember this. Jesus is in love with all of us. Jesus is alive. He is real. He is life. He sits enthroned in heaven in his glorified physical body. He will return physically to the earth. And by his grace, we belong to him. He's in love with us. May we be in love with him. And may he increase in us in Jesus' name. Christ is risen, risen indeed.